to go. How is everybody on this fine Tuesday at 1 p.m.? Feels like uh, feels like a Monday for some reason. I'm not sure why. It was a really nice weekend. Yeah, we didn't um, we didn't have a chance to get out much, unfortunately. But uh, did some some more lawn care for my mother, of course. And really threw out my back doing that. And uh, yeah, it was a, it was a nice weekend. Really hot. The air conditioning wasn't working, so it was even hotter in the apartment, which was awful. But yeah, no, it was good. It was my, uh, we were, you know, very, very worked on Sunday. So I did, uh, went to the falls and back on Sunday, and Saturday was lawn care. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a pretty good weekend. Busy week so far, very busy week. And um, thankfully this week, um, we're going to be uh, we're going to be taking it a little bit slower, okay? So we don't. I mean, we do, we do have content on both days this week, but um, it's not going to be as dense as it has been in the previous weeks, which is kind of nice. So it's a little bit of a slowdown for us. Um, uh, thank you, and everyone for uh, everyone completed their their midterm exam, which was awesome. The average for the midterm, I believe, was eighty four. So the average score on the midterm was 84%, and uh, everyone did really well, so I was happy to see that. Uh, I should be getting your assignment number one back to you tomorrow. Um, I've taken a look at probably half of them. I haven't graded them yet. Uh, I have taken a look at half of them, and the majority of them seem to be pretty good. Um, in fact, if what was the number? Um, if on your trial balance, if on your trial balance, uh, both sides bounds to, I think it was $301,263 and some odd cents, I think it was 63 cents, you probably got anywhere from 90 to 100% on that assignment. Um, because if you got that that point with the correct answer, it's likely just um, small little details that might be uh, present. But the, obviously, if you got to that point with the correct answer, then all of your arithmetic uh, uh, and uh, your, your seems to have followed the rules. Uh, yes, Catherine. Hi, David. Sorry to uh, interrupt. I just wondered if you could repeat that number again for me. I just missed it. The uh, the number from the assignment. Yeah, absolutely. I'll even I'll write it on the board here too. It was, uh, I believe Thank it was three hundred and one thousand two hundred and sixty three dollars, and I believe it was sixty three cents. Uh, if you didn't get the sixty three cents on yours, that that's perfectly fine. Excel does some rounding, uh, and that's kind of funky. And it also depends on how it was formatted. So as long as you got pretty much this number uh, on your trial balance, then you were you were pretty good. Um, again, I'd say anywhere from 90 to 100 percent because it means that you followed all the rules. Um, all of your balances were correct. All of your journal answers were correct. It may just come down to uh, a matter of, of details. So which accounts, uh, things like that. So uh, but they looked I, like I said, I've gone through um, around half of them. And uh, the ones that I have taken a look at look pretty good. So good job, everybody there. And I will I'll get you uh, your grades for them uh, back tomorrow. I don't know, probably before 3 p.m. But don't quote me. It's going to be a busy day tomorrow. Um, and yeah, so we've got this week, uh, this week we're covering obviously here special journals, subsidiary ledgers, and payroll. Uh, next class we're going to be talking about plant property and inventories, or, or property equipment and inventories, I forget, uh, same thing really though. Um, and then next week, the entire week, we're going to be uh, doing ratio analysis. So we're going to be showing you how to analyze uh, good afternoon, Zada. Uh, we're going to be analyzing uh, financial statements. Um, what would I say here? So this week is a little light, as I had mentioned on the content. Next week, um, it might be a little heavy, okay? Because uh, ratio analysis is one of the uh, the fundamental thing things that will follow you through the entire program. So we're going to be doing ratio analysis, or we're going to be introducing and doing ratio analysis in this class. You're also going to be expanding upon it in managerial accounting, and then you're also going to be doing ratio analysis in finance. So it's something that's kind of scaffolded through the program. 
So it's good to have an understanding about it right now. Um, there are there, there is going to be quite a, a bit of calculations, uh, but that's okay because we're going to we're going to approach it very practically. So we're just going to be doing examples pretty much the entire time. Um, that way you can you can make some notes as we're going. Okay. Um, and then obviously in the final week of the course, uh, it will you'll be doing your final exam. Um, we had mentioned last week that your final exam, um, you're, you're basically being asked whether or not you would invest in uh, Kara Foods. The financials are already posted to Blackboard, and you're going to be using your knowledge from the past couple weeks in order to understand, interpret, and analyze that information. Okay, you're going to be doing a lot of ratio analysis in your exam. Uh, which and, and to do that, you need quite a bit of understanding of those financial statements. So the balance sheet, the income statement, um, and kind of the things that we've talked about in the previous weeks. Um, I have, uh, in the past, I've allowed students to do the exam in groups. Okay, so this semester, I'm going to allow uh, you good people in the class to decide whether you do it individually or in uh, in a group. Okay, some people work prefer to work individually, some people prefer to work in groups. Um, I'll allow you to decide, but in a group, there's no more than two people. Okay, so no more than two people in a group, and I kind of, by the end of this week, I need to know what that group is. Okay, so you don't necessarily have to decide right now. Uh, you can let me know by the end of the week. Okay, um, so this week, like I said, we're talking about special journals, subsidiary ledgers, and payroll accounting. Okay, mm -hmm. the participation for this week is going to be a, we're going to be using a government payroll calculator. Uh, good afternoon, Ryan. Uh, and the, the PDF that you can pull, uh, that you can download off of the calculator, that's what you're going to be submitting for participation grades. And uh, we don't have to submit that until the end of the week, okay, because I want you to focus on the process uh, more so um, doing it as I do it. And then uh, next week, uh, sorry, next class, uh, we're going to be doing quite a bit of calculations around depreciation. Uh, I believe there's four of them, and we're going to have a worksheet that we're going to submit as well. Okay, and we've already covered one of the forms of depreciation. I believe it was straight line depreciation. So before we uh, get going with a quick knowledge check here, does anybody have any questions, comments, concerns? No. Okay. So I'm just going to put a poll up here. Oop, I missed one. Uh, which document is it for today's class? There are a few documents. Uh, yeah, there are, uh, and we'll show you what those are going to be used for. I'll show you what you're going to submit near the end of the class. You're going to be using on the internet. There's a there's a government there's a government of Canada payroll calculator. Um, it's just kind of an application that is. On the internet that you use to calculate your uh, calculate your payroll, you can then download a PDF copy of it, uh, and that's what you're going to submit. So there's really no documents on Blackboard. You're going to be generating it on and downloading it on the internet. Does that make sense? Problem. All right, so I'm going to put up a poll here. Do, do, do polling. Um, here we go. What is first? Oh wait. Why do we? Excuse me. I'm um, just making a question here. What do we do? What do we make closing entries? Blah, blah, because okay. 
So there's a question on the screen. The question is, why do we make closing entries? So last week, we talked about closing entries. And we need to make, we need to, under, we need to close the, the books. But why do we close the books? Why do we need to close the books? Okay, maybe, maybe another 20 seconds here. Why do we make closing entries? Okay. All right, well, uh, we, we do or make closing entries in order to prepare for the upcoming accounting period, right? Um, I don't know if you think it's fun or not, but typically it's not something that we, you know, it's not like going to play baseball, so I wouldn't say it's necessarily fun. Um, and the accounts that we're closing out are our revenue, expense, and income uh, summary accounts. Okay, so we're not closing out any balance sheet accounts. We're only closing out the accounts that would appear on an income statement. Okay, so good job. Most got that correct. Next question. Do, do, do. Uh, uh, true or false? The first closing entry is closing all revenue accounts to income summary. Oops, I can't spell today. There's a true and false question. The first closing entry, when we close the books, is closing all revenue accounts to our income summary account. True or false? Good here. Uh, one more person. Um, but yes, okay. So this is true. This is uh, the first closing entry is closing all revenue accounts to income summary. Uh, the one, and that's, I mean, based on the material we present, that is the first closing entry. The only little caveat I'd put in here is that if you did close your expense accounts first, uh, you would, and then your revenue account second, it would be the same, it's the, it, you would come to the same result, okay? But based on the theory that we present, uh, the first closing entry is closing out all the uh, revenue accounts. Good job, everybody. So we'll do another one here. Uh, do, 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 do. Stop. Um... When closing expense accounts to closing expense accounts, we must Okay, so this one is going to, I can't, there's, there's a word on Blackboard here, so let me explain this one a little bit. So when we're closing expense accounts, we credit the expenses and debit the income summary account by the full balance of the expense account. True or false? Yes or no? When closing the expense accounts, we credit the expense account and debit the income summary account by the full balance of the expense accounts. So think back to the entry. Expenses, sorry, expenses increase on the debit side and decrease on the credit side. So when we're wanting to reduce the balance of a 
of an expense, we would have to credit it. Okay. Maybe another 20 more seconds here. Okay. Uh, this question is also true. Okay. When we're closing the expense accounts, or the second closing entry, which is closing the expense accounts, we want to credit. We want to credit the expense accounts because that's how we decrease expense accounts, and debit the income summary. Okay, good job, everybody. Pull this one down. Go. Another one. Do, do, do. Um. Okay. Closing revenue. Oops. E. Um. So when we're closing uh, in the first closing entry, when we're closing our revenue accounts, we a debit the revenue accounts and credit the income summary. B credit revenue accounts and debit the income summary, or we debit the income summary and credit retained earnings. What do you think? And remember, revenue accounts increase on the credit side. So if revenue accounts increase on the credit side, we must do what to close it? And maybe another 30 seconds here. All right, maybe another 10 seconds. Okay. 
All right. This uh, the responses to this one were were a bit uh, nearly 50-50. Um, the answer to this question: so when we're closing the revenue accounts, we want to debit the revenue account and credit the income summary. If we were to credit the revenue accounts, we'd be increasing them because revenue accounts increase on the credit side. Because we want to zero out or close the account, we need to credit, or sorry, debit the revenue account. Okay, so um, always remember that when you're closing out, uh, when you're closing out a revenue or expense account, you always want to decrease it, and you decrease it by the opposite side of which it increases. Okay. So I just want to do another quick one here, based on that one. Uh, uh, do, do, do. Right. Just a follow-up question. Revenue accounts increase on the credit side and decrease on the debit side. True or false? Yes or no? Maybe another 20 seconds. Do, do, do. Okay, I think we're nearly good here. A couple seconds. Do, do, do. Okay. So, yes, revenues do increase on the credit side and decrease on the, de on the debit side. That's why when we're doing a closing entry of our revenue accounts, we debit the revenue account by the full balance so that we, we it has a zero balance at the end because we're, we're – we're debiting it. Okay, good job, everybody. Um, do, do, do. What else would I? Oh, yes. Okay. So, one last question, I think, here. Uh, yes or no? Um, Was my question? Oh yes. Um, Can't spell today. Uh, there we go. Okay, retained earnings is an account that shows cumulative profit or loss minus any, not and, any dividends or withdrawals. Yes or no? What do you think?
Okay, maybe another couple seconds. All right, so yeah, retained earnings is an account that shows cumulative loss or profit minus any withdrawals or dividends. Absolutely. It's kind of that rolling total of net profit or net loss that a company has over the course of its, its life. Um, it's also kind of the connection between the income statement and the balance sheet. A lot of people think that uh, have an understanding of the balance sheet and the income statement as you know not necessarily being connected, right? They're they're two, obviously they're very two different statements with two different purposes. However, there is a connection between them, and it's the retained earnings that is that connection because profit or loss turns into retained earnings through the final or third closing entry, which is uh, closing your income summary to retained earnings. So that's the connection between the two. Okay. Very good. Okay. So I'd say I was kind of monitoring everybody's responses. And I'd say if you got three or more of those questions incorrect, totally fine. Okay. I know it's stuff that we covered last week. So it might just be a, a start of the week thing. But if you got three or more incorrect, I would recommend going back and going over or reviewing the closing entry materials on Blackboard from last class, okay, because it's really important to assignment um, number two, which again, I believe is due uh, the 20th, okay, so it's June 20th. There we go, uh, sorry, I'm just looking at something here. Yeah, we're good. Okay, so we've got three or more incorrect. I highly recommend going and back, going back and focusing in on those three particular closing entries, just to make sure that you've got those down pat. Um, they all follow the same process, and there's examples. So if you do have any questions, uh, please feel free to shoot me an email or send me an email, and I'd be happy to go through uh, some of them with you. Okay. Very good. Good job, everybody. Um, so yeah. Let's get started with um, this week's content, but before we do, does anybody have any questions, comments, concerns, questions about last week, maybe clarification on any of the questions I just, I just asked the class? Okay, it's looking pretty quiet. Put a put a thumbs up in the chat if you're ready to continue. All right. Let us. So some things we're going to be talking about this week. Uh, we're going to be talking about special purpose journals, what they are how we use them. We're going to show you how special purpose journals differ from the general journal. We're sure going to how to use those special purpose journals. We're going to introduce the four or five, or I should say, sorry, the, yeah, the four or five different special journals that you can have if you want. And then we'll show you some, uh, we'll, we'll talk about what subsidiary ledgers are and what control accounts are. Um, we'll briefly describe the guest ledger and the city ledger, although I don't, I don't think I have a slide on it, but I will describe them. Uh, and then we're going to be talking about payroll, which I believe it will be, the objectives will be covered a little uh, further into the, the, the presentation here. Um, so the first part of our lecture, we're obviously going to be talking about special journals and subsidiary ledgers. We're going to show you what they are and how they're used. Okay, 
We're not going to create them, okay, because they're really specific to the business uh, that they're used for. Um, and then we're going to show you uh, payroll, okay, and payroll can be kind of a, 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 a can be kind of tricky to uh, progress through, um, but accounting or the accounting software has come a long way since 2006. So there's a much, e I'm going to be teaching you a much more practical way so that you can do your own payroll yourself. Okay. Because a lot of businesses actually outsource their payroll and that costs money, right? So um, this will help you um, do your payroll in a, in a timely and efficient manner. So what are special journals? Okay. Special journals are unique to a specific business and they're created for frequently occurring transactions and it's a journal that is dedicated to that type of transaction okay while in your assignments we used the general journal to record and post this information in reality we use special purpose journals that way all of all I, all transactions that are similar appear in a specific journal and because in your assignment I wanted it's much cleaner just to keep it all in one area but anyway uh, and these special journals are set up to meet the needs the reason sorry let me start that again the reason why special journals are unique to each business is because they need to meet the needs of the organization and the types of frequently occurring transactions that happen, right? Um, for example, um, has anyone been to a business that doesn't take credit card? Okay, yes, quite a few stores won't won't take credit cards. Reason for that is because there's um, there's a cost to being taking credit cards. Um, has anyone been to a business that only takes cash? Okay, yes, yeah. These two businesses, they will both generate sales, right? So we could, in theory, we, both of those uh, businesses could have a sales journal, which is a journal that is specially set up to capture all of the sales transactions that happen. However, they will differ based on the accounts that they have. For example, the business that only takes cash will only have cash as an account on their special journal. On the other hand, the business that only t that does not take credit card will have cash, uh, maybe um, debit payable, but will not include credit card payables on their special journal. And maybe it's a bit more, um, it's e maybe easier to understand with uh, some visuals, which I've included here. But the idea that I want you to take from this particular slide is that special journals capture specific transi uh, transactions and are unique to pretty much every business. Does anybody have any questions about what special journals are? They capture Transact transactions that are all unique to that journal. So all, all purchases that are made will go into the purchases journal. All right. Yeah. So here are some examples or types of special purpose journals that you can have, right? Yes, Catherine. Hi, David. Just wondering if you could clarify special journal again. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll just go. 
Go back here. There we go. So special purpose journals, they capture frequently occurring and similar transactions. So for example, uh, I'll put up a whiteboard here. Do, do, do. So this is your sales journal, okay? It will capture all sales transactions. Right? Whereas your purchases journal will capture or contain all of your uh, purchases, transactions. Um, you will have a payroll journal that will capture all of you, the payroll transactions that are occurring. And the reason we have these different journals, it does seem like it can be complicated uh, or making the process more complicated, but um, it does help us organize um, information uh, because all of those uh, transactions fall into a specific journal, right? So it's kind of organizing transactions by transaction type. I'm just going to put up a file here. There we go. Share. Scroll down, find it. So here are some examples of the types of special journals you can have, right? Uh, you can have a sales journal that captures all of your sales transactions. You can have a cash receipts journal, which will capture all of the transactions that resulted in you receiving cash. You can have a purchases journal that will capture all of the transactions, uh, all of the purchase transactions that you make. You can have a cash disbursement journal, which will capture all of the transactions in which you've paid out cash. And then you can also have a payroll journal, which will capture all of the transactions that have resulted, uh, that will capture all of your payroll transactions. And if you think about it, these are all frequently occurring transactions. For example, uh, sales happen on a daily basis. Purchases can happen a couple times a week. Payroll will happen pretty much every day. And in some cases, uh, cash is received and cash is given. So you use these special uh, purpose journals to kind of organize your business transactions based on type. Okay, so sales, purchases, payroll, things like that. And these journals represent the most frequently occurring transactions in the business. And that's why they're, they're quite unique to the business. Um, however, they do differ uh, based on that uniqueness of the business. And I'll, I'll show you that in a second here, the next slide. Maybe I'll be showing you that on the, the other slide. <laughs> so then what is the difference between special purpose journals and the general journal? Okay, recall that in your assignments one and two, we used the general journal for everything. Right. In practice, the general journal is for adjusting entries, closing entries, and other transactions that don't fit into the special purpose journals. And to uh, his question, <coughs> excuse me, uh, can, yes, um, the question was, can one business have more than one special journal? The answer is absolutely, but the number of special journals that the business has depends on the most frequently occurring transactions, right? For example, a um, restaurant, do most big business use special journals? Uh, another good question. Um, no, because most, uh, most big, uh, Big, big businesses or corporations, they use uh, accounting software or software that they, they've created. But, okay, so let me backtrack on that answer. Yes and no. 
the way we would do it or the way I'm presenting the information, which is the typical pen and paper way of doing it, no. A lot of big corporations have developed software where you would go in and you would enter specific transactions into um, a specific um, category, right? And then that would be that would be considered a special purpose journal. For example, when I went in, when I would receive my beverage invoices, so that means I would put my beverage invoices or purchases into the accounting system, I would have to categorize it. I would go into, sorry, I would go into uh, an application that we had. It was called uh, Arboss. So it's called Arboss. It's great. Um, and I would enter it in into essentially what would be a special purpose journal, except that it looks very different because it's on the computer. It's, it's a matter of input than actual format and layout, right? So do big businesses use special journals? Yes, but they look very different. When we are using special journals, especially without an accounting software, we can create them and they will serve the exact same purpose. Absolutely. Does that help answer your question? Awesome. All right. So how to use special purpose journals. Special purpose journals largely behave the exact same way as the general journal does. Okay. So your debits have to equal your credits, right? They follow the rules of debits and credits. And transactions are entered daily, weekly, and in chronological order. Okay, so pretty much it, it, it is pretty much, <laughs> it's a general journal. It's a, sorry, it, it behaves the same way as the general journal. Um, the only main difference is that in your general journal, it's not necessarily self-balancing. So you put in the debit and you have to put in the credit. In the special purpose journals, they are what we call self-balancing. So that means you're given accounts that you can debit and you're given accounts that you can credit based on that unique transaction type, right? For example, um, I'll get there with my examples. I don't want to, okay, well, no, we can, we can, we can do this now. Um, let's say you have a food truck, okay? and you only take cash, okay? So you sell, you sell, uh, I don't know, uh, $15 for a hamburger, okay? Let's say somebody buys a hamburg hamburger from you, okay? What would be the transaction? Like, how would you post that transaction? What would you debit and what would you credit? Exactly, Vanessa, right? So in the special journal, your sales special journal has to be set up so that you're always debiting cash and crediting food sales. Because every time you make a sale, you're going to debit cash and you're going to credit food sales, right? So it's self-balancing. It's, it's, um, it's self-balancing and all you need to do is put in the transaction amounts, right? In some cases, uh, you can have multiple uh, multiple entries, or sorry, multiple columns. So, let's say our food truck. Let's say our food truck. Um, we only took cash, and we served food, and we served beverages, right? On our special journal, we would have a column for debiting cash because we only take cash. And then we would have a column for uh, food sales. I'm going to put FS here. 
and we'd have a column for crediting uh, beverage sales. Okay, and again, all you have to do is put in the amounts. And it's self-balancing because you're already given the accounts that you're debiting and you're crediting because um, that's the specific uh, that's the specific, specific uh, transaction that you're trying to to capture. Absolutely, Vanessa. So here, this is an example of our sales journal, uh, sales special journal. Okay, it's very it's very crude. Keep in mind for a second. Now this journal has been set up so that every single time we have a sales transaction, we can capture the transaction so and that it's self-balancing. Every single time we make a sale, we're gonna be debiting cash because we only take cash. And then we would credit based on that sales transaction, either our food sales or our beverage sales, right? So no matter what sales transaction happens, we can always post it into this sales journal and it's self-balancing. All we have to do is just put in the information. Of course, in chronological order. Good. Let me, uh, they, okay, I'm glad that I'm glad that you brought that up because I felt like I, I could explain that a little bit better there. Uh, right, what are the benefits of a business that takes debit and credit card only? Uh, well, I'm not 100% sure. Well, I don't know. Uh, I feel like put yourself in the position of a customer. Um, if I was going in, if I only had cash and I didn't have my debit or credit card on me, which is rare, I wouldn't be able to pay. Um, so taking cash is always a good thing because it, it, you know, people do use cash to pay for things. Um, but also some businesses try not to, don't, will, won't, they'll always take debit, but some businesses don't take a uh, credit card because of the costs that are attached to it, right? And when you pay with credit card, the business doesn't automatically get that money, right? They don't like so if I were to go um, buy a hockey stick for fifty dollars and I paid credit card, wherever I bought that hockey stick from does not get that fifty dollars immediately. They have to wait like three or four days. So there are uh, there are benefits to taking credit cards because people pay with credit cards, um, but there is a cost to it. Uh, meaning the cash will have the full amount of the food and beverage sale. Yes, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So here's where we're going to talk about, yes, because debits equal credits. Absolutely. So here is where we're going to show you what the sa a sales journal can look like, right? The sales journal that you have or that you would create for your business will be unique to how your sales transactions happen. Okay. For example, here, in our sales journal, we are making the assumption that all sales are made on credit. When they're all made on credit, it means that we do not receive cash, right? And if we have sales and don't receive cash for it, that creates an accounts payable, okay? Or sorry, accounts receivable, okay? Let's also say in this hypothetical example, we're a hotel, right, where we have room sales for selling uh you know one night stays or two night stays we have food sales for, uh at the bar or in the restaurants and we have beverage sales and then maybe we've got a retail shop where we can have other income or other sales okay here oh why are the journals not showing up Sorry, every, uh, give me 30 seconds, everybody. The For some reason, the Blackboard is not picking up some of my, some of the journals, the images. Here, let me, um, I'm just going to turn the PowerPoint. Yeah, I wonder why it's doing that. I'm just going to turn the PowerPoint copy into a PDF. There we go. Perfect. 
done. Close. So I'm going to upload a PDF for this, and hopefully we can we can see what the example looks like. Do 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 PDF. There we go. It's just converting. It's going to take a second. Yep, there we go. Share. Oh. There we go. Um, so here is what the example of uh, a sales special journal would look like. Okay, you've got uh, a name. So this is obviously the sales journal. You've got a spot for the date because it has to be chronological. The description for each of our transactions that fit in our sales journal will always be the same, which is to record sales for the week because all sales are made on credit. Our debit that we include on our special journal is accounts receivable. And then in this case, we have, we can credit our food sales or our beverage sales. Okay. So I guess um, this would be a special journal for um, uh, maybe the hotel restaurant, because in this case, the special journal does not have a provision for room sales or uh, other income, right? So if there were to be those sales, it wouldn't necessarily fit in here. But all sales transactions otherwise for food or beverage will fit in here, right? And itself... Um, it's self-balancing because all you're doing is fitting in or inputting the information for each transaction, right? So all sales transactions will fit into this journal, okay? Um, there is a column here or an area for what we call sundry accounts. Okay. This is the off chance that there is, um, a credit or a different account that we need to, um, that we need to credit based on a, a you know, a unique transaction. Okay. Um, it's, it's kind of like a, what if column where you can post, um, or you can complete the transaction by posting to a, a different account other than food sales or beverage sales. Okay, but otherwise, all sales transactions must be able to fit into this uh, particular uh, sales journal. Okay. So what do you think? Is it a bit more clear with a with a visual? Do you have any questions I can help answer? Businesses that use credit cards take longer for them to get their money. Yes, absolutely. MX is the worst. <laughs> um, it, uh, any sale that's on um, on credit cards, it creates a, what we call an um, it creates a credit cards payable because we don't immediately, or sorry, credit cards receivable because we don't get the money right away. Debit debit cards are pretty they're pretty much cash. Like it happens like next day because it's a direct debit. However, credit cards uh, takes anywhere from three to four days, sometimes longer. Exactly. In fact, uh, most of the most of the restaurants I've worked for won't take MX. Absolutely. Yeah. Even uh, businesses uh, businesses that rely on high volume and low contribution, or sorry, they rely on high, high volume, uh, customer volume, I should say, because of low contribution margins per unit, 
they won't take uh, they won't take credit cards because it's just not worth it for them. Uh, for example, most uh, convenience stores uh, most convenience stores uh, won't take credit cards because it it's just <laughs> it, it, it dries up it dries up their contribution margin and they don't get the money back right away for it. Why MX specifically? Uh, because it just takes too long for MX to to reimburse uh, the business for the amount of the receivable. Why does MX do that? I'm not really sure. I uh, I don't know. I know MX. Uh, the problem with it was that in the states, MX is really big in comparison to how big it is here in Canada. And uh, maybe it could be an internet. I, I really don't know why they do that, but I know that when a lot of uh, American travelers or travelers from the U.S. would come to Canada, they'd be coming in with MX, and we'd be like, "Sorry, we don't we don't do that here, really." Sorry, and they'd be pretty angry about it. But uh, yeah, we didn't take it because they take too long to uh, to reimburse you, and the longer it takes for them to reimburse you, uh, that's bad because you need that money to repurchase inventory so you can sell it again. Right? It's called the the cash conversion cycle. Yeah, no, I I agree, and I don't know why. Totally agree. No problem. So yeah, going back to our sales journal here, all sales transactions will fit into this journal, okay? And we only post sales transactions here. The next example I have here is of our purchases journal. In the purchases journal, we are assuming that we're purchasing all account, uh, sorry, all inventories on uh, on account, right? So we're, we don't pay for them immediately, which means that we'll be in this transaction or all transactions where we purchase supplies, we will have to, to credit accounts payable. And then we would debit the relevant uh, inventory account that we're buying or that we're purchasing. Yes, Vanessa, and that's a great point to bring up. Each, each journal is classified based on the specific transaction type. Okay, so uh, all sales transactions will go into our sales journal. All purchases transactions will go into our purchases journal. So it's, it's yeah, kind of classified by transaction category. Uh, will there be an updated PowerPoint with the tables for our notes? Yeah, you should still be able to, uh, you should still be able to see it as a PowerPoint um yeah yeah the, the tables are in the powerpoint uh it's just it gets a, the the conversion between powerpoint and then the, the blackboard collaborate version is is not so good every now and then so uh you should you still be good though paul um yeah so every time we purchase an inventory whether it's food inventory beverages or office supplies those transactions will all be able to be captured in this purchases journal Always, and it's self it's it's self balancing because we already have the credits and we already already have the debit counts. We just have to input the information. Okay, awesome. All right, so it's two o'clock. What do you say we take a quick fifteen minute break? We'd be back at uh, two fifteen. How's that sound, everybody? Grab a snack. I need to go grab another glass of water. Okay, so let's take a break. We'll see everybody back at 2.15, and then we'll continue with the rest of, uh, of this, uh, this content. Okay, everybody have a good break. I'm going to turn off my mic now.
All right, welcome back, everyone. I hope everyone had a good break. Go, I clear this and move on. Or sorry, before we move on, does anybody have any questions about the, pur the pur purchases journal? Okay, so I have a question up here, true or false, or yes or no. The question is, whatever formatting your purchases journal takes, it must be able to capture all purchases transactions. Yes or no? What do you think? Maybe another 10 seconds here. All right. Uh, yes. So whatever Whatever way your purchase journal looks, it must be able to capture all of your pur uh, your purchased transactions. Absolutely. Good job, everybody. All right, so we will move on based on that. So here's a cash receipts journal. Receipts journal. This journal records every transaction that involves money coming in. So you receiving money, okay? This can take multiple forms, and all of the, the, the again, it depends on the, the, the context. Based on this cash receipts journal, it looks like the only way this business receives cash is by when their customers are paying down their accounts receivable or their accounts payable because an accounts payable to another company is an accounts receivable to your business, right? Uh, it looks in this case uh, that an assumption that would be made here would be that all sales happen on credit, which creates accounts receivable, and any cash coming into the business must be happening because people are paying down their receivables. So in this case, there's only two, uh, in this particular uh, scenario, there's only two potential accounts that can be affected, your cash increasing and your accounts receivable going down. And again, your accounts receivable are those sales that haven't been paid yet. Okay, so the assumption here is that all sales are on credit. Um, and yeah, in a restaurant, in a restaurant, you could have an additional column here uh, that would be crediting uh, food or beverage sales. Uh, do we hope that cash is higher than the accounts receivable? Um, blah, 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 like on, on a balance sheet? Is that what you mean, Vanessa? Well, the business, if you're, if all of your sales are on credit, 
means that your it will mean that your accounts receivable balances will be higher than your cash. However, when whenever you receive cash, you would put it in your cash receipts journal and you would credit your accounts receivable, so decrease your accounts receivable, and you would debit your cash so it increases. And because it's self-balancing, they will equal. Uh, but on a balance sheet, oh, okay, awesome. But yeah, no, on a, on a balance sheet, uh, typically your receivables are higher than your cash. Absolutely. All right. Uh, and then the opposite of a cash receipts journal is a cash disbursement journal. Uh, so it records all transactions that involve money going out or cash leaving the business. So the account that we'd be crediting here would be cash. Okay. We could also have another column for purchase discounts if we did take advantage of some pur purchase discounts. And we can also, we would then debit our accounts payable. Right. And again, this is assuming that most purchases are done on account. OK, so you would be decreasing your accounts payable. Um, yeah, the other columns here could be open for uh, whatever uh, whatever you use cash for. Right. So that could be uh, purchasing inventory. Right? You would debit food inventory or beverage inventory, uh, things like that. So this captures all the transactions where cash is leaving the business. Uh, in this particular scenario, we're assuming that most purchases or all purchases, sorry, are done on account. Why would you in, uh, include discounts? It's a good question. So when we're purchasing on credit, it means that we have 30, typically means that we have 30 days to pay a bill, right? So let's say you get a food delivery or a food invoice for $1,500, okay? Let's also say that the credit terms are what we call net 30. That's pretty typical, okay? So what this means is that the balance of the invoice, which is $1,500, must be paid in 30 days, okay? There are other there are some suppliers that will offer what we call discounts, right? So uh, net 30 or uh, net 20. And then the discount. OK, so you have two options now. You can pay within 30 days and that's perfectly fine. You'll have to pay the entire bill or if you pay in 20 days, you get a 10% discount, right? And how we record that in the journal is by crediting a purchases discount uh, account, right? So that our debits and our credits match. Uh, because if we decreased our cash in the bank by the full amount, we wouldn't be then taking advantage of the, um, the purchase discounts. Good question. Um, but in some cases, it doesn't make sense to take care, uh, take advantage of those discounts because cash in hand is always more uh, it is always more valuable than not having cash, right? And that's why they suppliers will offer that that purchase discount. Does that help, Mary Ellen? Exactly, Mary Ellen. Yes, it would be uh, pay, uh, getting a discount for paying early. Yeah. If you bought something that was on sale, you would just be paying the, the full amount and you wouldn't have to necessarily show that it was a, it was a sale. Good question. All right. So those were the special journals. And again, they're all dedicated to being able to capture a specific kind of transaction, whether that's sales purchases, cash receipts, cash disbursements, or even payroll, okay? We also have subsidiary ledger and control accounts. Control accounts are general ledger accounts 
that contain or control all of the information from subsidiary ledgers. Okay. The subsidiary ledgers are specific ledgers that have detailed information about uh, either your accounts receivable or your accounts payable. Okay. Uh, they detail um, when you owe suppliers and, and how long you have to pay them. And the totals of those, those subsidiary ledgers go to be the balance of your control accounts on your in your general ledger. So I'm just going to bring up my whiteboard here. Or actually, let me see if I can find a quick picture here. Um, accounts receivable aging report. So I'm just trying to find one that's not terribly complicated. Do, 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 copy. Um, sorry, but just give me 30 seconds. I just want to be able to put up a PDF so you can see it. Fundamentals. There we go. So let's see if I can upload this as a file. There we go. Do, 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 do. Please work. There we go. So this is what an accounts receivable aging schedule kind of looks like, okay? This is also considered to be an accounts receivable subsidiary ledger. It will detail, and they can take, they can take many forms. It will show who your customers are, the total uh, amount of money that they've owed you, and the current amount that is outstanding. And it's the outstanding amount on your accounts receivable that creates the balance of your accounts receivable. Okay. Then in the subsidiary ledger, it tells you what amount is due in what time frame. So in this example, ABC Inc. owes us $10,000 and they haven't paid and it's been 31 to 60 days, right? However, XYZ Limited uh, owes us $50,000 and half of which they've taken more than a month to pay us and they have the other half that's due um, that's not due yet because it's within the first 30 days. So the subsidy, the accounts receivable subsidiary ledger just tells us who owes us money and how long it's been since they've paid us, right? The reason we break this down is because when your receivables get this far out, so 60, 61 to 90 days and 90 days plus, this amount of money becomes harder to collect because it's more likely um, we want our money here because that's what our credit terms are, net 30. And any time or any amount of days past 30 days, our receivables become harder to collect. So this is an example of what an accounts receivable um, uh, uh, subsidiary ledger would look like. And it dictates what the balance on the control account would be. Another question here. Do, do. Would the business start charging interest? Um, I've never heard of that. Uh, some, some businesses do do that. Um, they can charge a late fee. Um, in some time, like from the, in the personal 
from a personal perspective, you know, if we don't pay our phone bill on time, we'll have a late fee. Maybe there's some interest um, on utilities. They can charge interest. Um, yeah. So in business, usually there's a late fee. And when it gets, um, when, you're, when your money gets this far out, like 90 plus days, and you haven't been able to collect it, you would typically uh, make a credit report on this business, which would affect their credit score. Um, you can, once it gets to 90 days, you can start to write off that amount of receivables as bad debts. And, um, and you can give, um, we call it factoring. So what you do is you can sell receivables that are like 90 plus days and haven't been paid. You can, you can sell them. You can sell that debt to a collection agency and then they will try and collect it. Right. Um, my mom does something similar. My mom has an accounts receivable um, business, so she collects receivables for uh, accounting and lawyer firms. And her job is essentially is finding out where this money is and this money. OK, so she wants to collect this. And um, yeah, so she's not a collection agent um, per se, but um, her job is to reduce the amount of receivables that are 60 days plus. Absolutely. All right, so I'm just going to put up the PowerPoint again. Do, 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 do. This one's PowerPoint. This one is PDF. There we go. Do, do, do. Okay. Oh, and sorry, before I continue here. And the accounts payable subsidiary ledger, it looks the exact same thing as the accounts receivable subsidiary ledger, except that it's accounts payable. So it's the amount of money you owe suppliers in different time frames. So within 30 days, 60 days plus, uh, 90 days plus, things like that. So very similar. So now we're going to talk about payroll. Okay. And payroll, I've, I'm going to try and present it here and I'm, I'm, we're not going to be doing, we are going to be doing some calculations. I'm less worried about you being able to um, do a payroll journal entry, although I will show you what one looks like. I'm more concerned and want you to practice being able to calculate the deductions um, off of employees pay. Okay. And then at the end, we're going to show you how to use the uh, G Canadian government payroll calculator so that you can do the payroll for your own company if you have you know anywhere from five to ten employees okay otherwise it may make sense to outsource it do, do, do. okay so here here's what uh, we would have shown on a, uh, assignment number one you know where uh, the, the post the journal post would be you know we would debit uh, our wages expense and we would credit cash and it was it was fairly simple and fairly straightforward in reality it's not like that at all it's um, the cost of having employees is so much the cost of having employees for a business is far more than just the wages of our employees for our example or for an example um, I just want to put up, oh, I guess it's not here. Um, and because of those intricacies, there's, again, there's more costs to having employees than just um, the cost of their wages. Payroll can be kind of time consuming, especially if you have a lot of, uh, a lot of, um, a lot of employees, which means that Many restaurant operators or food service operators who have medium to large scale operations actually outsource their payroll accounting to somebody else, to another business that will do it, right? Um, there's a business called Ceridian that will do it. I believe H&R Block will do it. Um, and essentially what you would do is just give them your, your payroll information and the amount of hours worked, and then they produce pay stubs they do all the depositing of money they do all the deductions they calculate um, the taxes that you have to remit and uh which keeps your hands nice and clean you don't have to get really dirty with it okay but if 
we have smaller businesses, then we can do the accounting pay or the payroll accounting by ourselves. Okay. Um, and it's important to know how to do the payroll accounting because in the event that you can't afford to outsource it, you're gonna have to do it by yourself. And it's important for you to understand before you get into business, the payroll obligations that business owners have. And again, that's not limited to the cost of an employee's wage. So some just uh, some some brief payroll accounting definitions. Your gross salaries are those salaries and wages that are earned by employees. And it's the amount of money that they've earned, but have, we have not made any deductions yet. Okay, so it's your gross pay. However, we do need to make some deductions from employees gross pay. And uh, there's actually quite a few of them. Um, we have to uh, we have to deduct uh, provincial and federal tax from their pay. We have to deduct employment insurance, and we have to deduct um, uh, uh, CPP or the Canadian um, the Canadian Pension Plan. Okay, if we take the gross salaries and we subtract the deductions from their pay it gives an employee's net pay, which is the amount of money that they're going to actually receive from us after all deductions have been made, okay? And because we are the employer, or we're taking the perspective of the employer here, we need to uh, tell them, we need to make those deductions off of the employee's pay and send them into the government. So we're gonna deduct taxes from, from each employee's pay, and we need to send them to the government. Has anybody owed money on uh, owed taxes money on their taxes? Has anyone done their tax return and then owed a hundred bucks? Two hundred bucks, three hundred bucks. Okay, Nathan has yeah. In fact, um, if you guys haven't used your uh, tuition credits just yet, I highly recommend you do because you get a lot of money back. Uh, I have as well. And I, th I, was, I was always really angry when I owed money because it's not me that's doing the deductions. It's not me that's calculating them. It's the employer. So at the end of the year, when I owe $300, like, why is that my problem, <laughs> right? Why do I have to pay that? I've already paid taxes. Anyway, so as an employer, we have to calculate those deductions for our employees, we need to make the deductions and remit them to the government. Another responsibility that we have as employers is that we also have payroll taxes. So just like the employee has deductions from their pay, um, we also have to pay certain deductions, right? And they, they're just straight expenses. For example, uh, we have to also contribute, the employer has to also contribute to the Canadian uh, pension plan. We also have to pay employment insurance. And we also have to pay um, the health tax. And there's one more. And we also have to pay uh, WSIB. So there's a lot of things. Uh, there's more costs that we will have as, as business owners or as management than just uh, paying uh, our, our staff their net pay. Um, and that's why payroll is actually really expensive. <laughs> and that's what we're going to be showing you today. Okay, so we're going to be showing you uh, gross salaries will be largely given, right? Based on those, uh, I'm going to show you how to calculate some of the deductions that we need to make from an employee's pay. And as an extension of that, uh, calculate their net pay. And then I'm going to show you how to calculate some of the employer's payroll taxes. Is there any money left? Any money left uh, where? Mm. 
Yeah, yeah, we would hope so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, the employee will have a net pay, which is great because that's their money, direct compensation. Um, and yeah, we while the expense we do have expenses as an employer that exist outside of an employee's pay, uh, they are they are how would I say they're they're relative to our the amount of our payroll and the amount of our employees gross pay so it is relative and it's we should still be able to make money and many people do good question it's always good when there's money left so here are some of the deductions that we have to make from an employee's pay oh, there's a typo there we have to deduct federal taxes for the canadian government we have to deduct provincial taxes and provincial and local taxes to both the provincial and municipal government, okay? Um, and it's also important to note that all of these things that we're talking about today in with respect to regulations around taxation, it's all unique to Ontario, okay? Every, uh, every province has different taxation uh, regulations. For example, Quebec, uh, has really big differences, okay? Uh, but again, we're going to focus on Ontario because that's where we are. Um, higher taxes in Quebec, exactly. Um, we're going to show uh, that we have to uh, deduct the employee's share of the Canadian pension plan. We have to show or deduct the amount of the employment insurance, or EI, from the, uh, the employee's pay. And in some cases, there are some voluntary deductions that we can make from the employer's pay, the employee's pay. Um, on tax forms, you can request that the employer deduct um, a certain amount of taxes every paycheck so that at the end of the year, um, you get a little bit of money back or at least you don't have to pay the government more money. I don't do that, but some people do. So here's a recording payroll example. Okay, this is some of the assumptions that we're going to use in the upcoming slides. Okay, so this is John Adams. I, his marital status is single. I don't necessarily think that's relevant, but that was included. Um, the pay frequency or the frequency that he gets paid is weekly. He has a federal and provincial claim code of zero. He has received a gross pay up until last week of $21,500. His weekly salary is $550. And he does have some voluntary deductions. In this case, it's union dues, and that's 20 bucks. Okay, so we're going to be using some of this information in the subsequent slides. And here's what the payroll journal entry would look like based on those pieces of information. Some of the items on here are, are a bit dated. I've gone through and I've updated all of the taxation regulations and requirements for 2021. So everything here, um, not in this particular slide, but everything else uh, is, is current. Um, this slide is just to show you what the payroll entry would look like, okay, where we would debit our salaries and wages expense, we would then break down all of the deductions that need to be made off of the employee's pay, okay, uh, which include federal and provincial taxes, employment insurance, Canadian pension plan, and any voluntary deductions, and then credit cash or uh, wages payable by the amount of the net pay, okay. Um, yeah, so it, get, it is a compound entry and it does get a little bit uh, complicated. I'm not necessarily worried today. I'm not worried about you being able to do a payroll journal entry uh, because the payroll calculator is going to do it for you. I'm more um, concerned with you understanding the taxation obligations of an employer as per your uh, learning outcomes. Uh, so we're going to focus much more on being able to calculate uh, the deductions and what they are. 
So federal and provincial withholding taxes, or very simply just federal and provincial taxes, um, employees have to pay those, okay, and they're deducted from their pay. The amount of taxes that you pay is largely dependent on your gross salaries and wages that you make, but also on other factors such as the number of dependents in your family, whether or not you're within, in school, whether or not uh, you come from a particular um, community, um, and things like that, okay? Other information or those other factors are collected on what we call tax forms, and those tax forms help us determine a claim code. The claim code will dictate how much money we can subtract from our gross earnings and, as an extension of that, determine your taxable income. Okay, so for example here, if you were to complete, and I'm going to go into much more detail about a lot of these items, let's say you completed your um, your tax form and you were a, uh, your, uh, a claim code uh, one. Okay, so, and this is all just hypothetical for now, which means that you can claim up to $10,000 on your taxes, okay, which means, and let's also say that you make $50,000 a year, based on your claim code and your deductible, we subtract the deductible, which means that your taxable income is $40,000, okay. I forget what the the, the basic claim, account, claim amount is, but I'll, I'll show you that in a second when I pull up the, the tax forms. And then the amount of taxes you pay is based on this and your claim code, which I'll show you in a second. So how to determine claim codes? So we use the federal and provincial tax forms and, to, and that will tell us how much money we can claim on our taxes and if you've ever had a job anywhere in Ontario or Canada, you've filled out a tax form before. Has anyone, has anyone filled out a tax form? Looks like that's a no. Okay, some yes. Yeah, absolutely. It's not fun. Yeah. In fact, my... Um, uh, my, my typical approach to filling out tax forms is just write my name, my SIN number, all that lovely stuff, don't claim anything, and then just <laughs> sign the bottom. But if they're filled out, uh, if you were to go through it and you were to read it, you can actually claim a lot of money on your taxes, and it kind of depends, right? But they are really thick documents. So here I'm going to show you one. Uh, so here's the tax federal tax form. Um, and you can't see, I'm going to zoom in just a little bit so I can see here, okay? Um, and again, the zoom function on Blackboard is just below the, um, uh, the what is this called? How much? Uh, it's, it's under the, uh, the view controls okay, on the top left-hand corner, so you can zoom in and kind of follow along with me. So this is a, a TD1 form, okay? Uh, this is the... Um, the federal tax form, okay, for 2021. Um, it's it, fairly simple to, the, to fill out at first. Uh, you put your, your last name, your first name, date of birth, employee number, if that's required, your address, postal code, and your insurance, social insurance number, okay, which is I always have a hard time finding because I think I've lost my, my SIM card. And then there's a giant list of different scenarios that may or may not apply to you as an individual, and it will tell you how much money you can claim on your taxes. For example, the very first line is the basic personal amount, which says that every resident in Canada can enter a basic personal amount of $13,808, okay? However, if your net income from all sources is greater than 151000 uh, uh, and you enter 13, you may have to pay more, uh, you may have to pay more. Yeah, I get it. 
uh, <laughs> see the, the 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 verbiage that they use is always a little confusing. So the very basic amount that anybody in Canada can claim on their federal taxes is thirteen thousand eight hundred and eight dollars. So you take your gross wages, you uh, your gross annual income, and you subtract that thirteen thousand, and that's what you're charged tax on. Uh, there are other scenarios, for example, whether you're a caregiver for uh, children under 18, you can claim uh, $2,295 for each infirm child born in 2004 or later. If you're older than 65, you can claim some money there. Uh, here's one that's relevant to you good folks. Is number five here is tuition. If you're a student enrolled in university or college or an educational institution certified by Employment and Social Development Canada, you will pay uh, and you will pay more than $100 per institution in tuition fees, fill in this section. Um, if you are enrolled in full time, enter the total amount of tuition fees that you will pay. So you would put that here uh, for the year. OK, and I believe that's where your tax, uh, your tuition benefits come from. And there are. Um, other scenarios, I'm not going to go through them all. It does uh, take some time to read, but you know you could save some money by doing a little bit of reading. And then you would total up all of the claim amounts and put them in your uh, your uh, your thirteenth row, okay, and you would put that here. On the second page, you're just asked uh, some more information, like whether you would work for more than one employer at a time, uh, and whether your income would be less than the total claim amount. Okay, whether or not you are a non-resident, and then um, whether you're living in a prescribed zone, and the additional amount of taxes that you wanted to, uh, okay, and this will help determine your claim code, okay, for the federal government, which is going to be pretty much the same thing as the federal, or sorry, for the for the provincial. I'm just going to share a different file here. Bloop, 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 bloop. Provincial tax form, you will notice, looks pretty similar. Okay, there's just less uh, um, categories or deductions that you can make. Um, and the basic personal amount for provincial taxes in 2021 is $10,880. You'll also notice that on the Ontario um, tax form, there is nothing here that relates to you being a student. Okay. And then you fill it out exactly the way you will um, do a uh, your federal tax form. And uh, yeah, to Vanessa's question, if you live in a prescribed zone, I, be I believe I believe that would be um, Native Canadians. Let me just bring it up. I could be wrong. Uh, federal tax form. Do do do. Uh, living in a prescribed zone. Uh, oh, no, it's not. Uh, if you live in the Northwest Territories, Nunavut, Yukon, or another provide northern zone, okay, uh, you can claim $11 for each day that you live in the northern zone, $22 for every day you live in a prescribed zone. If during that time you lived in a dwelling that you maintain, and you know, wow. So there are some tax benefits. Uh, for living in northern Canada. No problem, Vanessa. That's crazy. I didn't know that. So these forms, when you complete them, help determine your claim code. I'm going to share a different file now. Uh, go, share now. All the way down. Do, 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 do. All right. So ooh, it's a little big. So let me zoom out. There we go. So here are the 2021 Ontario and federal claim codes. Okay. Um, you may have a different claim code for uh, federal and provincial, but in some cases they might be the same. So if you're not claiming anything, you'd be a claim code zero. If you're claiming the basic provincial uh, personal amount, you'd be a claim code one, right? So this is where you look at that line 12 and your total amount of deductions to be made will determine your claim code, right? So if you were, if you added up all your lines, 
on your provincial uh, tax form and you were to find that you were, um, what is it called? You were deducting uh, thirty thousand dollars off of your uh, off of your taxes. You would use. Uh, you would be. Sorry, I'm just going to erase that. I thought it was a clicker. You would be a claim code zero. Uh, sorry, uh, ten. My bad. Because that falls within that range. And then we use the claim code that you have and your gross earnings to calculate the amount of. Uh, taxes that you pay to the federal and the provincial government. Before I show you how to do that, do you have any questions that I can help answer? Was that easy to follow? Was that fairly straightforward? What do you think? All right, put a thumbs up in the chat if you're ready to continue. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah, at this point, we're, we're working on calculating the federal and provincial taxes. So we have to have to have an employee fill out their tax forms based on their tax form. We will determine their total claim amount. And that total claim amount will give us their claim code. So we'll determine their claim code, which means we can start to look at the amount of taxes that they'll pay. So in order to determine the amount of tax to be deducted off each employee's pay, we can use governmental taxation tables. They're essentially a table. Um, it's a table that you use coordinates to find out the amount of taxes to be paid. On the top of this table, it lists all the claim codes. And then on the left-hand side, or the call, uh, the rows, it, it tells you uh, it's their gross, their gross earnings or their gross wages for that pay, that pay period. You, all you have to do is find the claim code and their gross earnings on the table, do some triangulation, and it will tell you the amount to be paid. To be paid. Okay. So <clears throat> what I'm going to do here um, is uh, we're going to find out what the provincial and federal taxes to be paid for an employee who gets paid $2,000 bi-weekly with a zero claim code. So I'm gonna bring up the taxation table. I can find it. There we go. I'm gonna warn you at first, it is huge. So I'm gonna zoom in a little bit here. At the top, you'll notice that each of the columns are labeled CC and then a number. That means claim code, and then the, the number of the claim code, right? Um, so the claim codes are over here. Okay, and then the pay is in the left hand, the far left hand column. We then do some uh, triangulation to figure out the amount of pay, uh, amount of taxes that they would pay. So if we zoom in here, and maybe put this in the chat, okay? So let me know the amount, and this is for federal deductions. It's labeled at the top for biweekly. Let's say a person who makes $680 this paycheck with a claim code zero. How much, how much taxes would we deduct? They're making 680, so their pay is 680 and their claim code is what did i say zero zero how much is the deduction based on this table i 
you know, wait for a couple of people to get their get a response in. Exactly. So we find claim code zero, which is right here. And then we find the amount of the employee's pay, which is 680, which is right here. So we just do some triangulation. And we get $88.95. I'm just going to zoom this in a little bit. There we go. All right. What, and that's the amount of the federal deduction. Okay. Let's go down to, oh, this is going to be tricky here. I'm going to try and find, oh, there we go. I can just do this. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to be going down to provincial tax deductions. There we go. So here's the Ontario provincial tax deductions. So in the other example, um, we used the pay was, um, 680. There we go. And this person had a claim code of zero. How much would they pay in provincial taxes? here look at the range yeah exactly you're both right everybody's right we find the range that best suits that particular pay which is right here and then we triangulate with the with the with the claim code yeah so this person would pay thirty two dollars and twenty five cents in uh, Ontario provincial taxes and $88.95 in federal taxes. Good job, everybody. What do you think about that? Easy to follow, fairly straightforward. We start, we see the connection between the claim code and the taxes. What do you think? All right, so I'm going to share PowerPoint again, the PDF. Okay, very good. Do, do, do. There we go. Oh, that's really large. There we go. So now that we've done the employer, uh, the employees' federal and provincial taxes. We need to be able to calculate the employee's deduction for employment insurance, okay? And at this point, it's important to note that both the employee, excuse me, and the employer contribute to employment insurance, okay? When you are contributing to employment insurance, you're taking a percentage and you're multiplying it by your gross wages, okay? So the employee, pays 1.58% in 2021 of their gross wages towards employment insurance, up to a maximum of $889.54. So what that means is that as you work throughout the year, you contribute 1.58% of your gross earnings to employment insurance, but once you've contributed $889.54 in the year, you then pay zero in employment insurance. Um, when you good folks are uh, are making, um, uh, when, you're, when you're working full time, you'll notice that sometimes around, um, what is it called? Sometimes around like June or July, your, your paycheck goes up for some reason. And that's because uh, you've maxed out on your EI. Uh, same thing with the employer, except the employer pays a higher rate. Uh, typically, the employer rate is 1.4 times higher than the employee. Okay, And once the 
employer per employee has contributed $1,245.35. They no longer contribute. I believe there's a question here. It also says on the paycheck the amount of the deduction for EI. Exactly. However, as an employer, we need to make those deductions for our employees. Absolutely. And that's how you do it. So let's um, let's do an example here. Let's say you're making 65, uh, sorry, uh, your biweekly paycheck, you're making $2,500. Okay, that's your gross earnings. Gross pay. Based on this information, what would your, and in this case, you're the employee, what would be your contribution or what would be the deduction for EI on your paycheck? Throw in the chat. So it's 1.58% of your gross pay. So you take your 2,500 gross pay and you multiply it by 1.58%. What do you get? Okay, remember that uh, you, in order to calculate this, you want to it's close. It's close to what I got too, but uh, in the, the decimals moved over a little bit more. <laughs> you have to turn the, the percentage into decimal form. So you're multiplying it by uh, 0 0.0158. Yeah. So in this case, when I take 2,500, I take 2,500 and I multiply it by 0 0.0158, I get... $39.50, okay, um, which is actually really low. Just let me double check something. Do, do, do. Stu view. Oh, wow, Stu view's uh, not acting up today. This is good. Yeah. Give me 30 seconds. I'm going to confirm that. No, that's yeah, that's pretty accurate. I mean, I don't make that amount of money, but uh, mine's my contribution's a bit bigger. So yeah, that's how you calculate the employer, the employee's uh, deduction, and you would do the exact same thing for the employers, except you would use. Instead of 1.58%, you would use 2.212, okay? Yeah. And then both the employee and employer, again, make a contribution to the Canadian Pension Plan, or the CPP, okay? And it is also based on gross, gross wages. Now, in the previous deduction for employment insurance, where the employer and the employee made different contributions with the CPP the employer and the employee have equal contributions okay in order to calculate the CPP contribution you need to take the gross wages for the employee subtract the exemption amount for the pay period which is 35 the exemption amount uh, is 3500 so you take 3500 divided by 26 pay periods, and then you would multiply that amount by the contribution rate, okay? In this case, the, in the uh, contribution rate is 5.45%, okay? And then once you've, um, what is it called? Once you've contributed up to $3,166 for the year, you no longer have to make a contribution. Okay, so a bit of an example here. Okay, so let's assume that uh, an employee of ours is getting paid $2,400 biweekly. 
what would be the amount of the contribution or the deduction for the CPP here? Maybe a minute. So first, you got to you got to take twenty four hundred. You got to subtract thirty five hundred divided by twenty six, and then you would multiply that. multiply that by the contribution rate in this case it's 0 0.04555 so what do you get throw it in the calculator Another couple seconds to do this. And uh, yeah, TJ, uh, sorry, TG and Mary Ellen got it. It's uh, the answer here. If we take 2,400 and we subtract the uh, 3,500 divided by 26, I think we get like 2,200 and change. Multiply it by 5.45%, and we get a deduction to be made of $123.46. So we have to deduct that from the employee's pay, but us as the employer, we also have to pay that, the same amount. Yeah. Very good, very good. So WSIB contributions or deductions, only the employer pays WSIB. WSIB, um, WSIB is 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 uh, workers' safety insurance. Okay, so basically, if anybody uh, gets hurt, uh, they're covered by WSIB, and uh, they can get paid um, while they're off. Okay. Um, the WSIB is is like an arm's length uh, arm's length uh, business with the government. So are they government? I'm not entirely sure, but um, we deal with WSIB separately than the government. So with most other taxes, um, employment insurance, CPP, we remit that to the government. With WSIB deductions or contributions, we we give that straight to WSIB. Uh, and how we calculate the contribution um, is we take the gross earnings multiplied uh, for each employee and we multiply it by a WSIB rate and then divide by 100. Okay. Um, rates for WSIB contributions differ across industries based on risk and can change from year over year. So the more accidents that you have happen in your business, the higher your WSIB rate is going to be. Okay. The current rate for food and uh, sorry food and beverage retail is one point uh, is one dollar and thirty five cents per hundred dollars, or one point three five percent of their gross pay. So we're going to continue with the example here. Let's say we have an employee who makes $2,400 biweekly in food and beverage retail 
what would be the WSIB contribution here? Exactly, I get the same thing. $32.40. There's two ways that you can do this. Um, you take the gross earnings, multiply by the WSIB rate, and then divide by 100, or turn this rate into a percentage in decimal form, and then just multiply by the gross earnings. It'll give you the same answer, the same result. Absolutely. Do, do. And then health insurance. So health insurance uh, is paid again only by the employer and it is based on the amount of yearly payroll. Okay, so um, and we multiply that by the gross wages of the employee, right? So if we have a total annual payroll of up to 200,000, we would multiply gross earnings by 0.98%, so less than 1%, and that would give us the amount of the health tax insurance deduction. And um, yeah, you'll notice that as the amount of your payroll goes up, the amount of health tax you pay also goes up. Okay, and this is only um, this is only uh, the, the employer only pays this. Uh, yes, absolutely, Vanessa. Do, do, do. So there's two ways we calculate the WSIB contribution. One, first way, in this case, would be the gross wages, 2400 bucks, multiplied by the WSIB rate, okay, and then divided by 100. Or it may be simpler just to do 2400 multiplied by 0 0.0135, okay? Because this rate here, uh, the WSIB rate is the amount of money, it's, a, it's a, the amount of money per $100, right? So in this case, the current rate for food and beverage retail is $1.35, you have to pay $1.35 WSIB per every $100 of gross earnings or simply just 0.0135% of gross earnings. So it'll get, it'll, you'll have the same result. Does that help, Vanessa? Awesome. Do, 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 all right, Done the health tax. So here's my payroll tip to you. If you got more than uh, 15 employees, get somebody else to do your payroll, okay? It is super time consuming uh, and very, can be kind of meticulous because you're, 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 you're working with like government uh, information and in a lot of cases, government information is not so easy to follow. So here where we're gonna take a, a 10 minute break here just so I can uh, give my voice a rest, okay? And then we're going to show you how to use the government's payroll calculator. Okay, so we'll take a, a ten. Yeah, they do make the yeah they do make the, the wording complicated on purpose. All right, so let's take a quick break. We'll take ten minutes. All right, let's be back at uh, we'll just call it three thirty. So we'll have a um, eleven minute break. All right, so I'll see everybody in eleven minutes. Grab a, a glass of water. Which was for, uh, simpler for us to stand, understand the wording. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> All right, everybody have a good break, and I'll see you in 11 minutes.
All right, welcome back, everybody. So here is what we're going to be doing uh, for the remainder of the class. We're going to be using the government's payroll calculator to determine uh, several deductions that need to be made off of the uh, off an employee's paycheck. Okay, um, the calculator will tell us the insurance, CPP, and taxes to de uh, be deducted off of the employer's uh, pay employee's paycheck and our contribution as well as the employer. However, it's not going to tell us the the amount of money that we're going to need to pay or expense to the health tax or WSIB. Reason for that is health tax it is remitted once a year and it's based on your annual uh, payroll. Um, and WSIB sends you like a monthly bill. <laughs> so uh, you kind of pay it as you go, if you will. So uh, here's an example. So me, David Cleary gets paid 2,400 bi-weekly, has a zero claim code, has made $2,400 year to date. So that means I guess this would be my second paycheck in the year. I've contributed $123.45 to CPP, or the Canadian um, Pension Plan, and $37.92 to employment insurance. Uh, I have no other deductions. For example, I do not live in Northwest Territories. I do not have to deduct union dues. And we are going to use the payroll calculator to calculate my deductions. And then we're going to download and submit a PDF to uh, this week's Dropbox. So you don't have to do this right now with me. Okay, I just want you to follow the process. Uh, just give me 30 seconds. I want to make sure that there is a Dropbox. Yes, there is a Dropbox. So by the end of the week, I want you to have gone through this example, download the PDF. I'll show you how to do that in just a second. And then you're going to submit that PDF to this week's, this class's Dropbox. Okay. Does that make sense, everybody? Do we understand the exercise that's about, that I'm about to do? And of course, this is for uh, participation grades by the end of the week. Put a thumbs up in the chat if that makes sense and you're ready to uh, continue. Okay, so the payroll calculator that I that I'm going to be using, I posted the link to it in the chat, but I'm going to show you using by sharing my screen. Uh, application of screen, Chrome tab. Here we go. Let's see how this goes. Yay! Okay, so I believe you can see this now. Um, there we go. So this is the, so I'm just going to see what that is. Okay, good. We can see it. There we go. I'm going to go back. Oh, if I do it this way, I can see the chat. This is awesome. Very cool. So here, when you when you put in that, um, uh, that link into your search bar, this will come up. Okay. Don't pay too much attention to this. Um, I mean, unless it interests you, but for our um, purposes today, we're just going to be using the payroll deductions calculator. Okay. Um, go down all the way here and it says to use the calculator, you just have to click I accept. Can you see now, Siyoung? No. Yeah, try uh, try reloading it, and I'm I um I am recording this so you can uh, you can follow along uh, in a bit. Maybe we'll actually just take thirty seconds so Sion can join back in. And uh, what can I say about the um, calculator before we begin? It's very um, uh, it's 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 straight it's fairly straightforward um it's just about you inputting information uh clicking next and then downloading stuff so it's all it's all fairly intuitive okay i believe so young's just joined just double check 
you can see now. Awesome. Okay. So let's continue. So again, you want to hit to continue. Please select I accept below. So I accept. There we go. The first uh, thing that we come to here is we want to select a type of calculation. So basically, we're uh, we can select a couple of things. One, we if the person's on salary or wages, we click salary. If they're on commission, we uh, use uh, that. If it has something to do with their pension, like if you're a pensioner and you're receiving a pension, you would click that. Or if you want to verify CPP and EIR contributions, you would pick that. For our purposes, uh, in most purposes, you want to click salary. So I'm going to click next. Dot C. We want to put in the person's name. So David Cleary, like that. The employer's name. So I'm just going to put in XYZ company. There we go. It's all just hypothetical for, for our example here. Uh, the province, well, we're in Ontario. The, pre, the pay period frequency is how often you get paid in a year, right? So typically people get paid bi-weekly, so that's a, pay, uh, it's a paycheck every two weeks. Sometimes people get paid uh, bi-monthly. Sometimes people also get paid weekly, okay? So in this case, because we're bi-weekly, we go to bi-weekly or 52 periods in a year. Or sorry, sorry, bi-weekly, my bad, uh, which is 26 pay periods in one year. Click that. And then click the date in which the employee is going to be paid. So we'll say two month. It is the sixth month. There we go. And the day will, let me just double check this. The day, uh, it, we'll call it the 10th. I'm not sure if this is going to mess it up. And then once we've inputted all that information, we click Next. There we go. So now we have to enter some information around gross income uh, and then uh, tick off some things that apply if they apply. Okay. So the gross wages for the period were $2,400. There we go. Vacation pay, I didn't receive any or no vacation was paid out. Did I receive a bonus or re retroactive payment? No. And then select any of these that apply. So a taxable benefit or allowance, uh, cell phone, internet, blah, blah, blah. Nope. Uh, employer's contribution to the employee's RRSP? Nope. Nope. Union dues? Nope. Uh, I do not live in a prescribed uh, living zone. I have no other deductions approved by the tax services. I um, I'm, <laughs> I would hope that my wages are not being garnished for any particular reason. I'm not tax exempt because I'm not indigenous, uh, of, of indigenous um, origin. And blue, 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 no, for that one as well. And then if you're a member of the clergy, you can select some of the following, but I'm not a member of the clergy or a religious uh, a member of the clergy. I don't know what, how, to, how to address that. You click next. There we go. Um, here's where we start to input some information around federal and provincial taxes. In the example, I said that I was a zero claim code. Okay. Uh, request and then requested additional tax to be deducted. Zero. Go. And then we're, now we're going to move on to the Canadian Pension Plan. Okay. Have I reached the $3,166 uh, limit? No, I have not. Am I CPP exempt? No, I'm not. My pensionable earnings to date would be my, um, what is it called? My earnings to date, which was 20, uh, $2,400. There we go. And my CPP contributions to date, I believe, were $123.45. There we go. And again, where I'm getting all this information is from the, the previous slide that I was showing. I come down to the employment insurance area. Okay. Have I reached the maximum of a contribution of $889.54? No, I have not. So I don't click that. I'm also not employment insurance exempt. So I click, and they already have for you, the year-to-date amount. 
Okay. My insurable earnings to date would be 2400 There we go. And my EI premium that I've paid to date were $37.92. Perfect. And then coming down here to the employment, uh, employer's employment insurance premium rate. Um, remember how I had mentioned that the, the employer's EI premium is 1.5 times the uh, employee's rate? In some cases, a reduced rate applies. In this case, we will assume that that's not the case. So I've included information around my federal and provincial taxes, my Canadian pension plan, my employment insurance, and uh, the employer's employment insurance. So now I hit calculate, and boom, gives us a, a summary of what's going on and who I am and how what I'm getting paid. It total um, it shows me the amount of federal taxes I'm going to pay, right here. Oops. Do, do, do. There we go. It shows me my provincial taxes. There we go. And it shows me the total amount of deductions from my uh, my income. Okay, for one of those. And then I have my my CPP contribution, my EI contribution. And then it shows me my overall deductions to be paid for that paycheck. And if we do the math here, 2,400, which was my gross pay, minus the total deductions, my net pay for the payroll or the pay period would be $1,717.35. Down here, you can click the employer ribbon summary. Do that. It shows you what the employer is required to submit. Okay, so it gives you the breakdown of the EI contributions and the uh, employer's CPP contributions. I'm going to go to previous here. Or uh, what was I going to do here? So in order to submit this for participation grades, what I want you to do here is you go to print slash save combined results. Okay, because that'll give you the net pay for your employee and your EI and contrib uh, CPP contributions as an employer. So as you do that, you click, you will download a PDF. Okay. We'll download that PDF. And I'm just going to share a different screen now. Um, do, 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 share. Stop sharing screen. Chrome tab. There we go. And this is the PDF that you will get. So it's the combined result of the the employee's net pay, okay, and their uh, the employee's deductions, as well as the employer's uh, contributions down here under the employer's remittance summary, okay. So what I want you to do is obviously download this, save it to your computer. And then um, put this uh, or submit your uh, your PDF to the week nine Dropbox, and we'll use that for participation. And again, all of the information that you're using to complete this calculator is found on the the slide that we have on uh, Blackboard. Okay, we got here. Do, do, do. So if you followed along and use the same numbers, just a different name, yeah, totally fine. Absolutely. Awesome. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. Uh, or before I do, does anybody have any questions I can help answer? Okay, Ryan, you might want to, uh, you got 758 for what?
You got seven. Okay, uh, you may want to check your inputs um, in the calculator itself. So if I just go back, if I, I'm going to share a different screen. Um, if you wanted to do uh, just double check your the information that you've included is correct, you would go to. Do, do, do. Okay, yep, uh, absolutely, yep, this recording will be available after. And if you wanted to make a modification, uh, you would just go to modify the current calculation, and it'll take you back to all the, the first step, but it includes all the uh, information that you had entered before. Absolutely. All right. There we go. So I'm going to stop doing that, put it up the file again. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. So while uh, for our employees, we have to do all those deductions for them and remit their taxes, their EI and CPP for them. However, we don't have to do that if we employ independent contractors, okay? And an independent contractor is a person that can work for several business entities at once without becoming an exclusive employee of any of them. Okay, so some examples here can be consultants, uh, temporary helpers, entertainers, musicians, cleaners, things like that. And again, if you employ independent contractors, you as the employer are not responsible for deducting employee payroll taxes. They have to do it themselves. <clears throat> and then lastly, the tip. Uh, the tip credit or, you know, servers making tips in industry, technically they do have to pay tax on that because it is income. However, they can, instead of telling the government exactly how much tips they made, which typically come in the form of cash, which can't be traced, they can remit or tell the government that they, uh, they estimate their tips to be a certain percentage of their income. And I forget what percentage that is. You'll have to forgive me. Um, and then they will pay taxes on that. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah, a lot of, uh, I don't know, some restaurants have tried to kind of do tipping a little bit differently, like include tips as a service charge, uh, whereby the income would actually be taxable. But uh, the servers and customers didn't like that. I kind of get it. So, yeah. So that was payroll, right? How we feel about it. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of how I felt about payroll when I first learned about it. <laughs> uh, what if they do wage plus tips separately? Uh, well, they do, uh, except that tips don't go on a paycheck. So technically, they're not they're not taxed. So the uh, the employer doesn't need to because it's not because it doesn't go through the business and it's not a part of the wages. The employer does not need to deduct uh, tips. Uh, uh, sorry, deduct taxes on the tips separately. Like they uh, they get their yes they do. Uh, my my servers would actually get their tips on a um, on a daily basis after the shift, but the back of house would get their tip out on a weekly basis. Yes, absolutely. Cool. Well, good folks. Um, uh, yeah. So if everyone pulled their tips, yep, you usually get to that would be tip out or tip pool, and that's usually paid out weekly or bi-weekly um, on the off pay um, on the off pay week, and those those tips aren't taxed either. Awesome. So good folks, that's all I have for today. Looks like we're gonna finish around 10 minutes early, right? I wanted to ask how you could prepare yourself for the exam. That's a good question. Well, I would I would download, maybe even print off the the set of financials that I provided, 
okay, and then read it. <laughs> um, you don't and then look at the numbers, okay, and if you don't know what the numbers mean just yet, that's totally fine. We're going to get into that next week. Um, but there is, there are financial notes attached, like there's a commentary all the way throughout that report, right? Read it. Understand the numbers tell a story, but so do the words in the report. The report is there to help uh, the verb, uh, sorry, the, the words in the report are there to help you understand what those numbers mean or what Care of Foods is trying to present. Okay. So uh, a good way to begin preparing for your exam would be to uh, download and print off that um, set financial statements and read it. Um, if you wanted to take that a bit further, you could go into next week's uh, next week's materials and maybe try to poke around uh, at some of the calculations and uh, apply some of the formulas to uh, to that financial report. Uh, but that might be getting a little ahead of yourself. You might um, it might be better uh, it might be better to just wait until we we cover that material next week. Uh, but yeah, I think in order uh, prepar in preparation for the exam, I would say uh, read the uh, Read the financials. Yeah, absolutely. No problem. Awesome. All right. So if there are no other questions, we will declare the this session of the Midnight Society adjourned. And uh, we'll see everybody on Thursday for, uh, uh, for plant property and equipment. Have an awesome day, everybody. No problem. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for a great class. I shall. You as well, Vanessa. Yes, everyone have an awesome afternoon. Take care. You're very welcome.